Daily Escape Pod is made possible by Patreon supporters like you. Welcome to the Reality Escape Pod, your lifeline when you need a getaway from the real world. I'm David Spira, alongside my co-host, PG Law. Together, we're exploring immersive gaming from all angles and we'll be joined by guests who really know their stuff. Today's guest is Barry Mead, director at Fireproof Studios and co-creator of The Room series. Welcome. Thank you for that lovely introduction. I didn't quite co-create The Room, but I'll, I'll take it if you're offering it. I'm so excited to have you on here. We're both huge fans. So happy to have you on. That's very nice. Thank you. A few years ago, someone asked me which video game had the most impact on me in the previous decade. And my answer was the original The Room. Wow. This game, in a lot of ways, changed the trajectory of my life, which is a weird, sounds like overly dramatic thing to say, but it's it's completely true. Uh, go on. <laughs> <laughs> 2012 was, by a wide margin, the hardest year of my life. Everything that could go wrong on a regular basis was going wrong in every meaningful way. One of the things that had popped into my life was playing this game. It reinvigorated something in me, a love of puzzles, a love of puzzle video games, a love of the games that I had grown up playing, the Mists, the Sierra games, the LucasArts games. A couple of years later, I happened upon escape rooms. I had been really primed by the room. I wanted the room to be real. I wanted a physical puzzle game. It was something I was craving. And when I actually found it, it put me on this completely different trajectory. In a weird way, it's how I met my wife. So my entire life was nudged in a different direction by having played the room. Wow, that's crazy. That's crazy to hear. It's crazy to say. <laughs> <laughs> I was a fan of everything myself. Like, I totally get where you're coming from in as much as you know, I, I've been so moved by other people's work over the years in exactly the same way you're talking about. And it has changed my life and it has made me think differently about things and it, and it has probably driven me in the direction that I've gone, right? And it's not like Michelangelo's Sistine Chapel here. I'm just saying whatever it is, comics, videos, music, anything. But those creators that m- maybe lots of other people have never heard of meant a lot to me and would have impressed on me the wider world, right? It would, you know, there's so much you can learn from taking you know, any form of culture. Um, so that's, that's really nice to hear that, because um, honestly, when we create these things in an imagined world, that's, that's our ultimate version of, of how we want that stuff to hit. Really nice to, to hear that, even though it's a little bit embarrassing. I get it. <laughs> the room was so immersive. That's what David and I talk about. Immersive gaming of all types, something like The Room. It's so realistic and lifelike. You really feel like you are there in this little jewel box, this little dollhouse. And there was something really magical about that. It's captivating. Yeah, it's interesting you brought that up because one of the things we thought that we were doing that was quite novel when the first game came out in 2012 on on iOS was to try and make the game world 3D in a way that most mobile games weren't especially puzzle games in fact were very 2d i mean they might look beautiful but they were very much 2d and you know they always get called pixel hunts and they kind of had that reputation but, you know our background is creating console games and pc games we um wanted to introduce some of the niceties and the sort of bells and whistles of AAA console games into much simpler games on mobile we were fairly conscious when we were doing it that doing things like adding physics to doorknobs and to keys as you turn them and adding weight to objects as you try and pick them up and manipulate them. And that the camera had inertia, sort of tactile feedback that the player can get through playing the game was quite novel. And I I think that really helped sell gameplay to people actually when they they picked up the game for the first time. It kind of felt like you were actually snapping a box open when you opened it rather than it just playing an animation or whatever. We tried to make things less canned animations and more leave it to the player to animate it themselves with their fingers and that it would react with some weight and some physics uh, as if it was more like in the real world. It was quite a light dusting of that, but it was conscious. We did do it on purpose. It felt it. I learned about The Room shortly after it came out. As I said, it was 2012. Angry Birds and Cut the Rope were the pinnacle of mobile gaming. Great games. Yeah, they were good games, but they weren't doing anything that was making me feel like I needed to be playing a game on this platform. They were games that were great when you were sitting on a train, but not games that were calling to me that like I I felt I needed this in my life. It was like eating junk food. Exactly. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) 
And I was lamenting this in a pub with some friends. And one of my friends informed me that I had clearly not played the room. <laughs> and so I went home and I got it. He was right. What I'm wondering is when you were building the room, the first one, did you take into account what had come before and what the perceptions were of mobile games? Yeah, yeah, we really did. We obviously started looking at this in 2011. When we formed the, the studio in 2009, we always intended to make our own games. And, and what we'd hoped to do was to earn enough through freelancing work to hire a programmer. We were six artists at the time to help us um, put a game together. We were three or four years in business and we had nowhere near enough money to make a video game. <laughs> Mobile wasn't even on our radar as a gaming device at the time. Not only were we console and PC game fans, we also made them for a living. That's where our background was. Um, we all came from uh, Criterion Studios, which was owned by EA. We worked on the Burnout games. So mobile wasn't on our radar. And the, the only reason we turned to it was because we literally couldn't afford to make any other kind of video game. With our small team and our paltry means, we had enough money to hire one programmer for about a year. That's what we did, right? We said, well, we have to build something. We want to make something, so let's try and do a mobile game. You know, I'd love to say we had a great contrary plan to be successful on mobile by doing the opposite to everybody else. It wasn't like that. It was much more that we just weren't wired that way. As designers and as players and as fans of video games, they weren't really on our radar, but they also weren't within our skill set to create, right? We wouldn't know anything about how to make free-to-play games engaging or what have you. And it was just a very different business. It was also much more expensive part of the business. Like you needed to hire marketing people and spend a lot of money developing your back end to make these kind of games. They're um, a very expensive business to get into. And again, we weren't going to do that. So everything spoke to us doing a very small, highly crafted graphically rich video game not least because we were one programmer and six artists um so everything was was very practical and it's it's very easy i think for for developers to look back on successes and 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 act as if everything went by a linear plan and you know it was a given that things were going to work out that way or or that we were we did everything super consciously and but it wasn't and it just so happened that everything we stacked into the game came out as looking as if it was like one product, when in fact it was really just a bunch of ideas that we bunched together to try and create something new. We were conscious, though, that we wanted to do something, I hate to say original, because it gives off the wrong impression, like we're not building on something else, because of course we are. Like I said, everything we're doing is about how much culture we've taken in ourselves. And if you're in a creative market and you're trying to sell things to people, your own influence is in our view, have to be written into what you do. Otherwise, you're boring, right? If there's nothing individual about what you do, why should it be you doing it? You know, and you kind of have to ask yourself that. But of course, you still have to remain commercial and, you know, you don't want to go up your own arse, so to speak. So we were very conscious of where the market was, to answer your question. Obviously, we knew what was selling. I mean, look, our competition was free, right? So everything we knew about what it meant to sell a video game up to that point was, was shifting under our feet. And we were really just desperately trying to navigate our way through this new landscape that we didn't know much about. And we relied on what we knew, which was high quality 3D graphics, which, like I said, coming from the console and PC world. And that's why we made the game that way, because that's how we were wired as creators. You know, I don't want to say it was written that if we did this, this was going to work, right? It, it wasn't. It was, we did it because we thought it was the best way, you know, the best way was showing off our skills was to drill into what we're good at. I mean, nobody else was really doing these high-quality, graphic-rich games at the time. Were they no, really? that generally was novel. The first decision we made when we started developing the room was not to support all devices. And nobody was doing that because the vast majority of your sales and your downloads on mobile is to all devices, right? That's 90% of the market. It's never the new. Whereas we were like, no, we want graphically rich, so we're cutting out all of these other devices. Now, again, you can look at that as, wow, what a great business decision, but Again, it was purely practical because the other benefit that it gave us was we don't have to support those devices now, right? We're not going to hear post-release from 100,000 people with massively different hardware all telling us that the game doesn't work or it runs too slow or whatever. All of that went out the window. And again, we were a tiny team. We couldn't afford to do that kind of tech support. It was an impractical decision for practical reasons. We knew it would make the game look much better and stand out. And that's all we were, were trying to do at the room was to try to make the best thing we could. And so every decision we made from making the game small to lighting it very darkly, making it fully 3D was, was all about trying to make the best thing we could make. The nicest looking, the nicest feeling, the nicest playing. And that's why the game is so short. 
what is lighting it darkly? Was that to save on? <laughs> does it? Does that? Yeah, because we don't have to build in the details into the world now because you can't see them. <laughs> Love that. The game gives you this impression through the audio and the visuals that there's a much bigger game world out there than the, the tiny one you're actually in. And all of these things were put in to um, basically mask how simple and small the game was, uh, how, how tightly we designed it. We've seen this also in escape room design. When a smaller company that has a lower budget, but they're really smart, they will only decorate things that they light, and then they'll light the game really brilliantly. So it doesn't feel like you're just entering into a purely dark space. You are just entering into a dramatically lit space, and the stuff that isn't lit falls out of your field of vision organically through the gameplay mechanism of the information there is not relevant, so you stop paying attention to it. Mm. Yeah, no, that's exactly true. And this is not anything that Fireproof invented. The notion of highlighting areas where you want the player to look is as old as video games itself. But how we use that was making the game actually dark and then only lighting these areas. That was more than, than usual, right? It was a conscious decision to make the game dark. But again, we wanted it dark for other reasons, other practical reasons, such as we like horror, we like creepy. That's what made it stand out so much from other games at the time, too, because back then everything was bright, candy colors, right. brightly lit, very cartoony. Yeah, yeah, exactly right. Yeah. And we were very consciously trying not to do that. You've touched on a whole bunch of things. We're basically going to be spending most of the interview unpacking. Fireproof Studios, as a company, you have started off small and seem to have remained deliberately small. What are some of the advantages that you have found going out of your way to keep yourself at a smaller size? When we started the business, we were pretty conscious from early on that we didn't want to grow the business. Now, I know that sounds daft, but bear with me. The spine of us getting together and the, the spine of that company when it formed was ultimately to make video games. It wasn't to work forever uh, doing contract work for other game developers. It was to save money to make our own games in the long run. We didn't know whether that would take two years or four years or six years, but that was the goal. Along that path, what we didn't want to do was bloat the team with people who were okay, but maybe not as experienced as we were in order just to win new contracts for freelance work because freelance was not where we wanted to go in the future. So why would we encourage that line in the business overly when that wasn't where we wanted to be? We kind of purposely sat on our own business in a way. You know, after the second year in business, our first year was very tough because it's very, very hard to start any company and keep it going for a year. But after that first year, things began to turn around. And by the end of the second year, we were always in work. Like we never wanted for work again. We also never made any money because we didn't grow the studio and we refused to grow the studio. We were paying our bills and keeping the lights on, but that was it. And that was the way we wanted it. Because we knew that one day we were going to flip the switch and turn into a games developer. And what we didn't want was six or seven dudes who have 10 or 20 years experience leading a team of 100 people who have hardly any experience at all. And then wondering what we're going to do with them while we try and figure out how to design a video game. This is pre The Room. Yeah, this is pre The Room. Okay. We did grow over time. We still hired people. It was just at a very low rate. So I think in the first two or three years, we grew from six to 12. And now we're 17, and this is 10 years later. So we did grow a little bit, and the people we hired were really, really good. And that was the point. We had a, a longer-term goal, and it was fixed on that. And that was always, always going to be the case. And I'm sure at times we had that discussion amongst ourselves, you know, should we just go all out and hire 20 people and take all those jobs that are being offered? And we just said, no, it's not what we want. We want to build a studio and a team. It makes a ton of sense to me. You also asked why, you know, what, we're like that now. Why are we not any bigger now? And, and we want to keep things simple, right? We used to work for big AAA studios. And my God, the, 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 just the, the price you pay in heart sickness and toil and getting through all the politics, everything that goes working in a big, complicated studio, we just wanted to do 180 degrees from that when we left. You know, we left for a reason. And we didn't want to ever replicate that reason in our own uh, team, in our own business. And ever since then, because the games have been successful, we haven't had to maybe take those different turns in the business that other businesses have had to in order to stay afloat and keep successful and, and keep money coming in. I think to some degree, if you had asked us in our third or fourth year of business before we released the room, what is our ideal state? 
other than being billionaires, it would be exactly what we have now, which is a very simple company that spends 99% of its time developing its own video games and has no ties to anybody and doesn't owe anybody anything and has nobody telling us what we can do or what we can't do or by when. We have kept up that idea of keeping everything very, very simple in order to keep the, the machine chugging along. It sounds like your studio has managed to retain its artist soul. I love hearing that. The thing is, if you want that kind of world, you do have to create it because it doesn't really, you know, a business tailored to your exact specification doesn't exist unless you create it yourself. If you look at the shape of Fireproof now, it is the shape of the people who, who founded it. We only want to make video games. That's it. We don't want to fill out forms or <laughs> convince other people to work with us who don't want to work with us or anything like that. So as long as our games continue to sell to our own audience, we're perfectly happy to keep it as it is. Sounds like the dream to me. But that's not to say we're not ambitious. We're massively ambitious. We want to be ambitious through our work, yeah, not through our business decisions as such. If we have a game that sold a million, well, we'd love to sell, have, make a game that sells 10 million. That's how we get our success, is through our work. I totally understand, yeah. We do that by keeping our environment so in such a way as we can do as much work as we possibly can. I'm actually a jeweler. I design like small custom one of a kind pieces that are quite high end. I don't want to go into like mass manufacturing, right? I don't want to do one design and sell like a thousand of them that are lower quality. I want to do one really cool custom piece. Yeah. So I totally understand. I'm not in the business of being a manufacturer. Yeah. And it's not to say that being a manufacturer doesn't work and isn't a clever business. Of course it is. For instance, if we started just constantly comparing ourselves to all of our rivals, you know, multi-billion dollar companies and all this, you know, we'd make our heads spin. So why bother? You know, we're not interested in chasing that world. And it can be hard when you are trying to plot your own path a bit more than is normal. It can be hard to convince people that what you're doing is the right thing. Because obviously people just look at precedent and look at what works, you know, what the market says works and da 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 And um, we've always kind of taken the opposite tack, which was, Imagine us trying to be those people. That would be terrible. <laughs> you know, we'd be so bad at it. This is what suits us. With the escape room industry, it's almost all cottage industries also. A lot of escape rooms are all individually owned, kind of, I guess, mom and pop. They're small businesses as well, where people have creative license to create whatever tiny worlds they want to. Yeah. You know, you're dealing with an audience that you hope or think will understand what you're trying to do. And, and as long as you're working within commercial paradigms, right, that you're not just doing wacky alternative shit for the sake of it oh people do <laughs> <laughs> i know i know and all i mean is stuff that's that excludes people that isn't inclusive i think sometimes debate about creative businesses is like well is it creative or is it a business what are you but it's a bit of a false choice really because even though we're creating what we want to create in the way we want to create it we're massively influenced by the commercial world we want to be successful we're not creating for instance wacky control schemes that take four hours to learn or do you know what I mean? We're not trying to reinvent the wheel for people. So as much as we are making, are very much making something that's in our own image and that isn't really being made or wasn't at the time being made by other people, uh, it was still easily as commercial as anything else that was out there. You know, you're cut the ropes and whatever else you're talking about, you know, and it was accessible. We didn't want it to repel anybody just by picking it up, you know. That's what I mean. It's, it can be a false choice, I think, this notion that you're either artistic or, or, or business-minded. When you're in a creative industry, you have to be both. If you don't have one or the other, it's it, you're ultimately going to fail on either side. If you aren't thinking through what your business side is, you're not going to have the money to produce what you need. And if you aren't thinking through your product enough, then it's all going to fall apart anyway because no one's going to want to play it. Yeah, yeah, exactly right. And I think for us, because we're not necessarily, we're not businessmen in the business world in that sense, in that we're not, you know, we're not making money from money in any way. We just make money by selling things that we make, and that's it. So you're not invested in GameStop? <laughs> no, <laughs> no, we missed that one. Uh, that and Bitcoin, damn it. To that point of accessibility, at its foundation, the Room series is basically digital puzzle boxes. It's all very fiddly. You touch it, and it does more or less what you imagine it's going to do. Where did the initial wave of ideas come from to produce that style of play? You actually just said it. The initial idea for the game came from puzzle boxes that are that you would see in Japan or China, right? These beautifully handcrafted, they could be jewelry boxes, whatever, but they've got 10, 20, 50, or 100 different movements that the player has to do to open the boxes. How this came about was we knew we didn't want to make traditional mobile games, but we wanted 
to make something that made really good use of the touchscreen, right? Because we thought that the touchscreen was the most unique thing about mobile devices. So we wanted to come up with ideas that really took advantage of using the touchscreen and therefore tactility, right? And just a sense of touch. So it literally was us trying to recreate a puzzle box and then the morphing from it being a literal puzzle box that you might find in the shop into a video game called The Room set in this creepy Lovecraftian world. That's really just the effect of what happens when six nerds get around a screen and get to say, oh, oh, make it pink. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what we do. It's, it's all of our own tastes in the game. That's what it is. It's like, OK, we've made that puzzle box, but we've done it in our way and, and using the sort of sensibilities that appeal to us. And that was very much made up organically. The very first build of the game was literally a puzzle box, a digital puzzle box, nothing like the room. Look at it week four, look at it week eight, look at it week 12. It changes every month. And then, you know, by the end of, I think, seven or eight months, it had turned into the room and we released it. One of our um, first guests, Alon Lee, who helped create Exploding Kittens, his story is kind of similar where he had come up with the game concept, the mechanics of it, but it was called like Bomb Squad. And it wasn't until he partnered up with an artist, the artist took a look and he was like, well, this is a fun game, but the concept is we've seen it a hundred times before. What if you made it cute kittens that exploded and put on a different skin? And that is what really made it different. Because things become successful, we want to read into them a bit too much sometimes. And we want to assume that some sort of lightning bolt of genius arrived and someone slaved over a hot game design for 20 years before you're climbing the rock face of success or whatever. But oftentimes it isn't. If it's the moment you're sitting on the toilet or in the shower or you chatting to your friend or like it is those moments. They're, they can be just as inspiring as any other moment. I think the successes in video games and I'm, I'm sure in other creative worlds as well are often just built organically. I've described the room as we came in every day and made the game up. <laughs> we didn't know what we were building. We didn't start off to build the room. One of the things that you were just talking about was the tactile nature of touchscreens and how using that was one of the driving inspirations for building the room. In your latest game, The Room VR, A Dark Matter, this feels very much like the previous games of the series, but it also feels intentionally designed for a new medium in VR. What was the most significant design change that you felt you had to make when shifting from touchscreen to VR? It depends which part of the team you ask. <laughs> Certainly the controls was the thing we cared about the most, I would say. Not only how the controls themselves felt to use for the player, but also the UI design, how you interact with all the objects. That side of things took a lot of working out on our behalf before we were confident that the game was actually good enough. There was a lot of learning there for the first six months, really, of us putting together different types of control systems, different UIs. Obviously, the usual chopping and changing our puzzles massively, depending on player feedback and stuff like that. But yeah, I think navigating VR space is always the biggest change. It's the biggest difference that players feel when they put it on for the first time. As a team, you're primarily 3D modelers. Your background is in creating the visuals of a video game. When you started producing these games, my understanding is that you were really building the mechanics on a visual way. And then at some point later in the process, you added in the art and more of the narrative. Is that correct? Yeah, that would be broadly correct. Yeah. There is a palpable story and feel of cosmic and Lovecraftian horror in the finished product. At what point does that get worked in, in your process? It's different now, for instance, than it was when we made the first game. Now we're, we're really just already feeding into an already existing world, right? Which is the world that the previous games have created, which is this sort of Lovecraftian light, Victorian influenced uh, world, if you want to. But I think originally it would have been just um, what we were into. Like I said, it was the notion of doing it kind of came from you know, we, we've always liked the idea of making a horror game. And I think in 2011, 2012, we felt at the time, and if you look at the record, horror games were going through a bit of a slump at that time. There really wasn't many being made, and we were all Res Evil fans and all this. So all of this was in our head while we were creating this little tiny mobile puzzle game. It just naturally gravitated to being a, a creepy little puzzle game because we were already in that headspace. It was what we wanted to to make, uh, we wanted to draw on this kind of culture to um, make the game. So it just seemed fairly natural at the time. Also, 
every game faces that problem of what is the wrapper? How is it presented? What is the world it exists in? You can create gameplay and have it exist in almost any world, appealing to any kind of audience. The decision to as to what kind of wrapper you put your game in is always quite important. Um, but we did want to make something creepy. We, we knew we couldn't make a horror game because it's, you know, it's mobile. It's very hard to do that on a, a little phone, an, uh, iPhone 6 or whatever it was back then. But we did want to make it creepy or at least weird, right? We wanted to have that that atmosphere. And we, we knew that it was, an, it was an atmosphere we could do with our small budget and small team. If we just, instead of trying to put all these different aspects into the game what if we just suggested them and so that way we did a lot with the audio and we've always done a lot with the audio in all of the games to suggest this different world and the mood of the game i was gonna say i remember i think that was one of the first games where when you first fire it up it says we recommend that you wear headphones while you're playing this game and i don't think another game had ever had that recommendation before and it really just made this difference you could hear the sounds moving it was a really a 3d sound picking something up you could hear that little tick i think that was really uh successful cool again i'm glad to hear you say that that's great because that's really what we want the thing what we're trying to do with people is we're when you play a game you want to transport them and again with no mobile games there was this there was just this sort of stuffy opinion about mobile devices that they're supposed to be played one way by one kind of person in one mind state and they only want one or two kinds of games. That was the blanket thinking across the mobile industry at the time. Whereas what we wanted to do was we wanted the same effect that we get when we play console and PC games, which is that we get lost in these worlds, right? And we're, we're taken away somewhere. And it, that's why... For us, video games hits just as big as movies or music or any other kind of culture because it takes us away somewhere. And you sort of have a relationship with the creator that, and they have it with you. All of this stuff is, is um, really important, I think, in, in, in successful creative work. You're speaking to each other, right, as the creator and, and the player. And you're talking the same language and you're agreeing with each other. This is one of the novel things about it. This is what drives people to create things and try and make people like them. It's, it's what I talked about originally when we, when we first started talking. You know, I'm just, just going back to that idea that we're all taking stuff in. And then as a creator, your job is to sort of regurgitate what you love. Horrible word, but you know what I mean? Regurgitate what you love, but in a package that makes people see it in a new way. That was such a beautiful way of putting it. I never thought <laughs> about video games being a conversation between me and the creator, <laughs> except yeah, now, I mean, <laughs> but it's him regurgitating. So. I, yeah, yeah regurgitating is not, not the best word. But, <laughs> like a bird. Um, exactly. you are, like, <laughs> I, I feel so loved. <laughs> like anyone who creates music for a living loves music. They live and breathe it. And they're desperately trying to get a connection with other people through their music. Video games isn't quite as maybe dramatic as that, but it's absolutely the case that anyone who's creating something uh, for a creative market rather than just a, an object to be sold like a TV, it is that conversation, it is that communication that drives them because it's what influenced them in the first place. They were spoken to by something else. So like if you're a creator, it kind of is your job, as a video, for instance, as a video games creator, it is your job to convince other people why video games are amazing. That's what we do here. You have to make people love, the, love video games and you have to do that through your work. And that's job number one. On the subject of this dialogue between creator and player, when I played The Room, I felt like it was the first time in decades that what felt to me, and I, did, I didn't know at the time, but what felt to me like a AAA studio had updated and modernized the classic puzzling and adventure genre. When you were producing this game, especially the first one. Did the classic point and clicks, the Miss, the Seventh Guests, the LucasArts and Sierra games have an overt influence or was that something that was more incidental because you were already making a fiddly, puzzly box structure? I think they absolutely did in that we had taken this stuff in in mm -hmm. our lifetimes and it would have influenced what we think is cool. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't overt. We weren't looking at Mist, and we weren't looking at Monkey Island or any other game, or we weren't trying to recreate what other people had done at all. The package we were making felt like the first time for all of us. Mm -hmm. None of us had ever worked on a game like this or even seen a game in this shape before. So it did feel new to us in that sense. But in the same way I talked about before, like we're just sort of, in a way, conduits for other great work that we've taken in, and we're just trying to show it in a, in a new light. So in that respect, those games absolutely did play a part. 
after the game came out and was released, we were kind of shocked at how many people came up to us and said, I love Mist. Your game is like, it's the nearest thing I've seen to Mist. Or I love Resident Evil. You know, the puzzles in your game are like the best Resident Evil puzzles. Or, you know, and it, we would have that games getting name checked after name checked after name checked to us all the time. Yeah, I would say those things are, were definitely uh, an inspiration in, in one way or another, whether direct or indirect. I know you aren't an escape room person, but I was curious if you and your team were aware of the impact that your games have had on this broader escape room industry. Nope. Both the players and creators. Nope, didn't know that was a thing. Cool. When we had contacted Barry to come on the studios, they were like, we don't make escape rooms. We don't know if we're even a good fit for your podcast. <laughs> and Dave and I were like, you guys are 100% a perfect fit. For well, I, look, tr tr trust just, us. You're, you're, you're... Just to explain that, I wasn't <laughs> saying that none of us have played escape rooms. Of course we have. We're just not, we just don't know anything about that world. The thing that I'd love for you and your team to know is, especially among the higher end escape rooms, these creators have all played your games. The tactileness, the mechanicalness, the telling story through vibe and through player interaction and hinting at worlds rather than hitting people over the head with them. All of the things that you guys have been doing has had a massive influence on this completely separate arm of gaming. Cool. <laughs> I didn't know that. I mean, uh, yeah, we wouldn't be aware of that at all now, to be honest. Um, we do get contacted by people who run escape rooms um, occasionally. Um, we've also had some people come at us to sort of, to see if we were interested in, in making a room themed escape room, um, which I think like definitely would be something we'd like to see, I guess. But, um, but we're also terrified of bad work. We're terrified of associating our name with bad work. And we are very, very careful with putting our stuff with anybody else's work. Very, very careful of it. Probably paranoid, I would say, in fact. Um, so th those inquiries that haven't really gone anywhere, you know, maybe we could have been more generous towards them and, and listened a bit more. But, um, you know, our fear, is, our fear is bad work. I mean, it's the same in video games. And 90% of it is not interesting. So not a question. But a little bit of a plug. We were connected to Barry through Roger Shembry, a graphic designer at Fireproof. He has an official The Room Lego set that is up on the Lego Ideas website. It needs a few thousand more backers for this thing to actually become real. And we are on a bit of a mission to make it real because we want to assemble it and play with it. I'm asking you to take the two minutes or less to go onto Lego Ideas and just Click a little button that says you think this is a good idea because it'll help make this thing happen. You can find more information about it in the show notes. And we have a whole interview with Roger on that project up on Room Escape Artist. It's super interesting. Here, here. Moving on to the heaviest question I have for you. You began your career working on 16-bit era health edutainment games for a medical equipment supplier. Did you learn anything significant to your career while working on Bronchi the Bronchiosaurus and the AIDS Avenger? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was my first job in the industry. I was a pixel artist, basically, a pixel animator. That's what, that's what I did for those companies. And yeah, I would imagine I learned a shitload, actually. <laughs> I certainly would have learned about shipping things. I mean, the, the rate at which we got through work there was pretty furious. I remember I had to convert so many different graphic file formats. It was crazy. For a single game, we'd have to do 25 different sets of graphics from two color all the way up to 256 color. You, of course, you picked up a lot about how to put a game together in a much more basic way now. The company was actually called PCSL, based in Dublin and Ireland. I was there for, I don't know, a year and a half, two years, maybe something. So it was a halfway house in a way between the world of successful video games that I went into and just being a bum in the street. <laughs> so in that respect, well, I, did learn, I did learn an awful lot. It's just that it wouldn't necessarily have been, it wouldn't have made that much difference to my next job. The next job I had after them was working for Bullfrog, who were my favorite developers at the time. Yeah, you know, I was their biggest fan. Um, and when I went in there, it was a whole different ball game about, see, about a different level of seriousness about what we did and what a video game can be. 
so it, the mechanics of how to make a video game I would have learned but not really anything creative in that respect that all had to be learned over the next 10 years or whatever or 20 if I can still learn what am I talking about but you're right that I mean it was um it was definitely a stepping stone it was even more a literal stepping stone because the, the boss of that company PCSL in Dublin so happened to have worked in his previous company with the um art director of Bullfrog so he wrote to him and said, I've got this guy who's a great artist. You should give him an interview. That's cool. I found some video. We'll put these in the show notes of these two games. They are very different. <laughs> <laughs> the AIDS Avenger was our, was our genuine creation, but Bronchi the Bronchiosaurus was a port, I think. There was a couple of other games. Interesting. Yeah, we, I found an infomercial for kind of the set of them that's up on YouTube. Um, so wow. that, that'll be on the show notes. <laughs> <laughs> Prior to forming Fireproof, your team was all working at Criterion on primarily on the Burnout series. How did those games change the way that you operate? What Criterion did very well was focus. Burnout was really about one thing, which was risky driving. It wasn't about driving. It was about risky driving. And so that developed from Burnout 1 up to Burnout 4 and 5, and they developed it really well. So by Burnout 3, it was like the spectacular drama simulator of massively violent car crashes but in a creative sense i think their focus on doing one thing better than everybody else right that was the kind of way that they would put it i think we we all took that away with us to fireproof mind what we're good at that's a that's a form of that focus right which is uh, choose something and knock it out the park instead of trying to do everything try, instead of trying to be all things to all men just choose something and do the best damn job you can. You know, if you're doing X amazingly well, don't worry about the fact that you're not doing Y and Z, right? Let the other people do Y and Z. Just do, uh, if you're going to do X, make it the best X that's ever been done, right? That's kind of the attitude. And then I suppose in secondary is just the fact that that's where we all met. The reason we were six artists that formed Fireproof is because we were the six leads of the, the environment team for the burnout games. Um, and that's where we all met and sort of became friends. And, but we also became a team first, right? We became a team in Criterion, and then that team left to form Fireproof. And actually, one of the reasons we left was to make sure that our team didn't get broken up, because that's just so normal in video games, right? You get posted to different games, might even get posted to different countries, right? In a company like EA, that's not unheard of. So it was very common for people to shift around, and we had worked together for, at that stage for five years and had such a good relationship and had such a good way of working together that we did, just didn't want that to end. And that was part of the reason why we left was to continue working together. That is the sweetest story of a company <laughs> forming that I have ever heard. They didn't want to get broken up. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, it is true. It's definitely part of it. That, I mean, there's obviously muckier reasons. I just don't think it's that relevant to go into the ugly things that might have made us want to leave. It also makes perfect sense that you guys were the team that worked on the environment. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So the room is basically a giant environment. That's all it is, right? Recon, the reality escape convention, our convention for immersive gaming, is going to be entirely digital again in 2021. It will be hosted online on August 22nd and 23rd. You can find all of the videos from last year's convention on the Room Escape Artist YouTube channel, and you can find out more about this year's event at realityescapecon.com, where you can sign up for our newsletter to learn more as we start to release the information about all of our speakers and vendors and sponsors. We have so many wonderful things already lined up, and I cannot wait to inform you of all of it. What comes next for the room and for Fireproof Studios? I don't know. We don't know. I mean, we have some projects that we're looking at now that we really want to develop as our next project. You know, we released the Room VR last March. Since then, we've been working on the Room Old Sims for PC, which we just released, and that went really well. So uh, we're also, we always have things to do. This is the thing, like, especially when your games are old and have been out a long time, there's always porting work to do. There's always catch-up work, updating. So it's quite easy to get pulled off the, the mainline track of what is our next uh, original project. But we're finally getting back to that now. We don't do a lot of top-down designing at all, actually. We we tend to much much more um, congeal around ideas than designs, if that makes sense, or themes even. And so we'll, we'll have a few themes like, you know, just, just to make it up, RTS game set on a planet with an elephant. Uh, and then we'll go and build 
a version of an elephant RTS game on a planet and they'd see what it looks like. Though we've always had this ground up way of doing things of like, let's first build our notions rather than our designs. Let's first build something that's really broadly what we're aiming at and then tighten it up as time goes on instead of saying, instead of arriving with the vision and saying, right, let's replicate this vision digitally over the next two years. We don't do it that way. We're always alive to what the project can do and what it can change into and what it can alter into. So for us, when we're developing a game, that game is live until the day it goes out and any idea can get put in and any idea can get taken out. The whole wrapper can change, the ambience can change, the audio world can change, everything about it can change at any time if we feel it isn't working. I would say we're most creative with our decisions, but in the way we work, we're very practical. And so we very much allow the games to tell us what to do rather than try and tell the game what to do, if that, if that doesn't sound too, too silly. We are really looking for the software we're playing to sort of speak back to us and say, this needs this, you know, I need that. I am crap. What can you do to make me better? Rather than having this preconceived notion of, OK, in two years, this is exactly what this is going to look like. It's not the way we've ever done it. We'd much rather just run with an idea immediately than try and plot it all out. So we very quickly get to building the game way before we ever speak to anyone about it or, or show it to anyone. We've already got a working version of the game before we've really got a design document written. I mean, when you can, when you have the skills in pretty much your whole team to produce, it seems like that's a really rational way to go about doing it. Um, it probably has its downsides too, and that it's not as efficient because we will spend more time pulling stuff out and putting stuff in. But we believe it actually comes out with a better product at the end. It's almost impossible to pre-design everything in a video game. So, you know, our view is we have confidence in our ability to execute ideas. Yeah. So change is not scary to us. If by constantly changing, you actually come up with a better game, then that's actually the way to go about it. Again, this is what works for us. It's not necessarily going to work in the next team over. It's just the way we're used to working. And it feels natural and comfortable for us to try and create in, that, in those circumstances. Barry, thank you so much for sharing all of this history and your experience and insights with us. It's been a total pleasure. Thank you. Likewise. The Reality Escape Pod is brought to you by RoomEscapeArtist.com, your home for well-researched, rational, and reasonably humorous escape room and immersive gaming content and events. Thanks again. We truly appreciate having you on. No worries. Thank you very much for the invite. If you're enjoying this podcast, you should join our Patreon. Some of the perks include a patrons-only Discord and exclusive bonus podcast content. Every podcast will have a companion after show where David and I talk about the interview we just recorded, as well as chat more casually about games we've been playing, industry news, and well, whatever we feel like, really. You can get access to this bonus content for only $5 a month. And a lot of times the after show is even longer than our interviews. $15 gets you access to the Spoilers Club, where we pick a game each month and then we will discuss the game after we've all played it. This month, we'll be playing and discussing Isolation from Escape Room Melbourne. Make sure you've played the game before listening and we can spoil to our heart's content. We've got higher tiers as well, and we want to give a special shout out. Thank you to Wesley James, Byron Delmonico, Paula Swan, Rex Miller, Scott Olson, Breakout Games, and Derek Tam. None of this work would have been possible without the support of all of our incredible patrons and the community at large. Thank you. So if you like what we're doing, and you want to support our mission of creating a global community of escape room and immersive gaming enthusiasts, check out our Patreon at patreon.com slash room escape artist. <laughs>